forbid you're the weak and I'm the tyranny Hello. Welcome to this edition of Palmer's Picks. The way it's going to work is, basically I'm going to invite a guest on every week onto my show and ahead of time they're going to give me three movies that they either really like or really dislike. I'm going to watch them and formulate my own opinion on it. And then they're going to come on the show, I'm going to show a little clip, and then we're going to discuss it. Um, at the end of the show, I'll you know, summarize the, you know, whether or not I like the movies or not, and if I did, then it's considered a Palmer's pick, and that means I recommend it, so you should go out and try to find a copy of it and run it. Um, joining me this week in studio is Sean Cameron, one of my friends. Welcome, Sean. Glad to be here. Go ahead and have yourself a Coke. All right, thanks. Relax a little bit. So, why don't you go ahead and tell me what your three movies were that uh okay i picked beautiful girls the sting and right on home to discuss today all right um well let's uh start off with the sting um basically it was a movie it you know it was directed by um george rory hill right starring robert redford and paul newman two very excellent actors i mean great actors and it was set back in the 30s. Um, I myself was a little, you know, worried when you told me one, that one just because, you know, I had watched The Great Gatsby with Robert Redford and I thought it was terrible. I, I couldn't. It. Oh, it's, it's a terrible movie. It's about the Roaring Twenties, um, set right before, you know, that time period. Hmm. Right. And he's this rich entrepreneur and I couldn't stand it. It was one of the worst. Like, it was so incredibly boring. But, uh, you know, so I was kind of reluctant to start this movie, but you know, I watched it and I really liked it. I thought it was, I like the nostalgia in it was excellent. Oh like, yeah, definitely. Like all the stuff that they had in it and everything, and you know, the vocabulary they used, like the diction, it was like all true to form. Cause, yes. I mean, you know, just just some of the words that they used. <laughs> That's Redford and Newman. Uh, oh, it, it's great. In the thirties. Yeah, and and it was just, you know, really well portrayed just and like the cameos and stuff that they had in it like were just some people like you know these people mm -hmm. you've seen them before but you know it's like they they had their own time and then you know this movie was obviously shot in time like early 70s right so you know these people who did the cameos were big at the time mm -hmm. but you know um maybe some of the generations that are you know coming up after us you know, aren't even going to know these actors, right. and that's a shame because some of them are just excellent mm -hmm. actors and actresses. Um, uh, well, why don't we go ahead and go to the clip? Uh, I I chose the clip where Robert Redford first mm. meets Paul Newman's character. Okay. So um, go ahead and roll the clip. Carnival. Glad to meet you, kid. You're a real horse's ass. Luther said I could learn something from you. I already know how to drink. Sorry about Luther. The best street worker I ever saw. He had you down as a big timer. What happened? The Conda Senator from Florida on a stock deal. Little lobby, I thought he was going to take over General Electric. Some shantuzzi woke him, though, and he put the feds on me. You mean you blew it? Luther didn't tell me he had a big mouth. He didn't tell me you was a screw-up, either.
You played any big cons since then? Oh, I landed around a bunch of bullhunk towns. One kick ahead of the gene head. Would be still if Billy hadn't set me up here. Don't kid yourself, friend. I still know how. Stay for breakfast and you already know how to eat. Pick something up along the way. Is Lonergan after you too? I don't know. I ain't seen anybody. You never do, kid. All right, that was, you just saw um, Robert Redford's character where he first met Paul Newman's character. And basically what happens is um, Robert Redford and this other guy, I don't know his name, were <laughs> working, they were conning people and um, he got killed. Robert Redford's partner got killed. And so he wants to get back at this big Irishman who like runs all the, the gambling and everything in Chicago and New York. He wants to, you know, get revenge on this guy. So um, Robert Redford's original partner set it up so he could get trained by Paul Newman because Paul Newman is supposedly the best con the artist, artist, yeah, in, of Chicago. So um, that was where they first met, and obviously, I mean, as you can see, Redford wasn't Redford's character wasn't that impressed with yeah. Newman's character at all, but. It's I, the Conley pool is just amazing because mm -hmm. it's it's so well planned out and they just throw it together like it seems almost overnight in the movie but it's like but that's what they did for a living you know he they had a group of cons who all that's what they did and they did it and they pulled it off it was it's it was an excellent movie a lot of twists in it yeah um, you know all kinds of stuff in it what um what do you think some of the strong points were of the movie. I like Newman, especially like in the oh, poker yeah. hand on the train. Oh yeah, love that. Yeah, that was great, and you know how they pulled the whole heist off of stealing the guy that they were conning. They stole his wallet, and then Newman goes into a poker game and bets with this guy's money. <laughs> and uh, you know you, you can't get any more classic than that. That mm -hmm. was just hilarious because, I mean, this this Irishman thinks he's you know losing all this money, and he goes to pay it off, and he has no money at all because. Newman stole it, and Paul Newman was betting with the money that the guy lost. So uh -huh. it, it was just amazing. Um, what else? I mean, anything else off the top of your head that just like sticks out of your mind? That you got the whole Redford. Oh yeah. As a con artist, I mean. Yeah, that's great. That's beautiful. And I mean, it, you know, compared to some of the films that Redford's done in our time right like lately yeah he, it's the horse nothing whisper. oh the horse whisper what's that <laughs> oh god oh no or you know and, um, I kind of liked him in Indecent Proposal that was because he played the whole you know real slick yeah, kind of yeah. guy and, I mean he was so like debonair and everything in that movie and it was just amazing because he was you know he had just the attitude you knew that this man had power in everything yeah. that he said and that was awesome but I mean this was like a totally different role for him because it was you know, it, it's something that you're not used to seeing Robert Redford play because now he's, you know, he's a veteran actor, mm -hmm. so he has all this experience, and you know, he's going to get the more serious roles because that's what he knows he likes to do. But this, you know, gave him a chance to. I mean, this movie, I thought, I mean, it expanded my horizons at least for Robert Redford because he, you know, it was a more. No, I wouldn't really say comical, but compared to like his roles now, Definitely, it was comi yeah. more comical, and. It was just real fun to watch him, you know, play this kind of character because he did it really well. I thought. I mean, he was excellent at it. And Paul Newman, of course. I mean, Paul Paul Newman just, you know, that's just true to his heart, like playing that type of role because he's always, you know, a smooth talker. Yeah. Always knows how to, you know, get things done. And I mean, he was just amazing in it. It was. I just thought it was, a, you know, a very excellent. Movie and of course you saw Coke. There was a Coke billboard. I spotted that really in the movie. <laughs> yeah, can't see that above the drugstore. It, that was amazing. So Coke has been and always will be a part of everyone's life. <laughs> the Coke billboard was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You can't get much better. Coke will always be there. All right. Enough about the Coke. <laughs> um, let's go on to the next movie, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Um, uh,
Beautiful Girls. Beautiful Girls. Another very good movie, I thought. Great movie. Um, you know, it's hard to summarize this one just because, it, I mean, it's an all-star cast, basically um, featuring, you know, names like Matt Dillon, Mira Servino, Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, Timothy Hutton. Timothy Hutton, Uma Thurman. Michael Rappaport. Michael Rappaport. Great, great man. I, I think he's hilarious. <laughs> he does, and, you know, he's kind of like, He's almost like Buscemi because he he does small parts. He's always like the tag along. Right. His parts are always uh -huh. like a tag along. But he does that part so well. Why else would he want to do anything else? But it's basically about a group of guys who live in a small town, um, and they have and it's their love troubles is all it's about and just what they have to do to try to conquer these love troubles and you know it's not the true to form love story where it's like every guy gets you know the girl they want and. Yeah. I, it, it's just excellent because I mean it shows every every aspect you can think of in you know in like a love relationship happens in this movie I mean not necessarily in every group of characters but like there's you know there's the Matt Dillon with the old girlfriend right and you know a new girlfriend and trying to cope with which one does he want and then there's you, you know grab a port with my, the yeah afraid of commitment yeah exactly and thinking of the beautiful, you know, he's looking for the beautiful yeah, girl. Yeah, the perfect woman. Yeah. Um, and Timothy Hutton, who just doesn't know what he wants. He's right. not sure exactly what he wants. So, I mean, and these, you know, these actors and actresses just pulled it off. So, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And like, because it was, you know, it was, it was a good story. And, and it's, I think there's almost also in there too, like, where, it's hard to span the horizon between your friends and a relationship, you know, and it's like, mm. because it's like they had this, you know, this close group of friends yeah. who would do anything for each other, and then, you, you know, they're, they're trying to have relationships, and, you know, they're getting dogged by their friends if their, you know, relationship isn't working out right, All right. and then they're getting dogged by their girlfriends because, you know, they want to spend time with their friends, so, I mean, it was just, it was excellent, but, um, why don't we go ahead and show the clip for that? Okay. Um, this is a scene with Matt Dillon and uh, Michael Rappaport where they're discussing what do they want to do for the night because there's a high school oh. reunion coming up. So uh, go ahead and roll the clip. I can't believe you're not going to go. Yeah, I'm laying low. You have fun. You loved high school, Bernie. Everybody's going to wonder what happened. So tell them, uh, tell them I'm in Geneva doing my presentation on sub-zero water removal. You just want to sit around here all night long like a loser. Channel 38 showing rich man, poor man. All 12 parts. Back to back. <sighs> 364 nights here I do. The one night I decide to go out. You got a tape for me. I can't do it. Why not? You can't tape rich man, poor man. You gotta watch it on TV with the commercials and everything, just like everybody else. That's a good point. Doc and Eddie. Oh, man, oh man, was there ever a more terrifying screen villain than Falcon Eddie? No. You can watch it? Yep. All 12 parts? Back to back. It's a tough call. Yep. yep. Hmm. Don't drink too much punch. Oh, what a great scene! Good That's scene. just Michael Rappaport is so hilarious because he, I mean, he, I mean, he was like a tag along and you know, dazed and confused. He was mm -hmm. great in that, and um, 
Goodwill Hunting. He was a tag along in that, and right. that you know he's just like a small character always, but he, that, that's what he does best. I don't think he could star in a movie. Oh no, <laughs> I don't know if I could handle it. Because no, there's too just, much rap report. Oh, I know. <laughs> stop <laughs> it, please. <laughs> Enough. Oh, the decisions that he had to make in that scene. You know, do I stay and watch this marathon, or do I go to my high school reunion? Oh, it's wonderful. He, he's just he's hilarious to watch because he. His, between his facial expressions and just the way he talks is mm -hmm. just great. Um, another thing I wanted to cover about this was, you know, the, um, when this movie first came out, it was, it was around the same time when um, Rosie O'Donnell had first started mm -hmm. her, her talk show. And at that point, she had made the status of the Queen of Nice. And I remember the guy from Wings came onto the show. I, like, one of the main characters from the show Wings came onto Rosie O'Donnell's show and he says, and he said that the in-flight movie was Beautiful Girls. And he said the Queen of Nice, you know, wasn't really nice in this film. And she she has one scene where she's just filthy in I the scene. I thought maybe you just that scene. Yeah, it, oh, she was just so incredibly filthy because, uh -huh. oh, she whips out a penthouse and... She's talking about yeah, the boobs and the... Yeah, and just how everything, the, it, it doesn't exist. And But she made good points, though, how, you know, men, you know like use these perfect women yeah and then it never gives the real women a chance because those kind of women don't exist and no. i mean obviously they do <laughs> no, they don't they're in the magazine they have pictures oh they, my they, God. they exist but um mm. you know she was just foul mouthed in that movie I, I she was terrible um and then there was the whole dylan thing and with with matt dylan's character that just drove me nuts because I, I'd be torn in his situation though too because he, he's got you know Mira Sorvino mm -hmm. and then he's got uh, what's her name Lauren Holly Lauren Holly that's it I can't remember her names I'm terrible with names okay. but both these women are running after him and he doesn't know which one he wants and I can see his situation but I don't know if he's already got Mira Sorvino like set because Lauren Holly's character was married at the time yeah and so not available yeah not available but you know, if Mir Servino was like totally available, I think I'd go for that instead of like trying to break up somebody's marriage. And they have that conflict though in the movie, and they cover it pretty well. And but I mean, I just think it was just hilarious though. Like all the shots, like the group shot in the bar when they're playing the piano and singing, you know, Sweet Caroline. Uh, yeah, Sweet Caroline. Neil Diamond. Yeah, and they're singing that song and. With Uma Thurman in there, and the bartender with her one friend Stinky, who's like, and him and his brother are just like these. They're I would they're unattractive. They're, yeah, definitely. They're, they're just unattractive, and then Uma Thurman walks in and she's their cousin, and they just don't believe it. But you know, Uma Thurman kind of played to me. She played you know this, like, like omniscient power, like who guided like these characters through yeah. the movie because. She's she, the perfect woman with the perfect relationship. Yeah, and she like helped them, like explain to them what you know what they were doing wrong and everything. Mm -hmm. And of course, Michael Rappaport screwed up her help when she was trying to help him. <laughs> but it, and that was funny. And then another thing that I thought was excellent with um, Timothy Hutton and the next door neighbor. Oh, the, the twelve-year-old girl, girl. Yeah, fell in love with. Yeah. She, first off, she's an excellent actress. You know, yes, I, 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 She just portrays so much great emotion, like through that character. It was, it was excellent, and I mean, I, I had trouble believing she, like, I don't know, she acted. I guess she was just her, like, character was very mature because, very mature, yeah. like, other than her looking thirteen, when she talked, the way she talked, she didn't sound thirteen at all, mm -hmm. and it. But I mean that was a good that was a good thing and it's like that's true to life because you know Timothy Hutton fell in love with this little girl and she you know thought she fell in love with him you can't really make that decision no, because no. she was so young but he fell in love with her and you know he did but I mean she was 13 obviously he couldn't do anything about it I mean they even made the joke you know Winnie the Pooh. who yeah Winnie the Pooh and you know they called him Jerry Lee Lewis and everything because mm. he married his 13 year old cousin Jerry Lee Lewis did but. Um, it was just, I mean, but it was a good thing because it's, it's like true to life, though, in the sense that, you know, 
just because love picks you, it doesn't mean that you can act on it. You yeah. know, it's like it's not all totally fate. It, can, right. it I mean, it can't be totally fate because if it was, then obviously it wouldn't be a problem for him to hook up with this thirteen-year-old girl. <laughs> but I mean, but I just thought that that, and they did it very well. I mean, it's I mean. The way they portray portrayed it, I mean, because they could have gone the approach like Lolita and like totally went the wrong way with it, and then mm -hmm. it would have been very wrong. Or they could, <laughs> or he could have like just broken her heart, and then you would have felt a different way about Timothy Hutton's character, or he just like broke her heart, and it was right. pointless. And then you probably would have hated his character. Uh -huh. But the way they did it, I thought it was just excellent because, you know, you know, like the analogy you said with Winnie the Pooh, where. You know, Christopher Robin grew out of Pooh, mm -hmm. and eventually she was going to grow out of him. And I, you know, that was very good. But you know, I I thought the movie was you know very well done. The all star cast was excellent. I couldn't have seen another cast in this movie. No, definitely just because it was. I mean, they each one of them got into their character so well that it just it worked. Um, I don't know. I look forward to the day I could. Start a plowing business with my buddies, huh? Yeah, we're there. All right, um, all right. For our last movie, we have U2's Rattle and Hum, directed by Phil Juwanu. Phil Juwanu. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, Phil Juwanu. Um, this was recorded during the Joshua, Joshua Tree Tour. Yeah, Joshua T Tree Tour. Um, and it just basically covers all the things. You know that they did. You know, in between that tour and recording for Rattle and Hum, yeah. um, I just thought one thing that you know that really like I really caught on to was just how much power they have as a group that U2 has. You know, to be able to do whatever they want mm -hmm. to make a song work, like they just fly out to Harlem to record with, you know, a chorus and. Yeah. It's choir, not chorus. Yeah, yeah. choir. <laughs> choir, there we go. But they just, you know, they just fly out to Harlem and, you know, they re they record at the Sun Studios and they, the, you know, one of the scenes that I just loved was when they went to Graceland and oh, right. Larry wanted to take a picture on the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. And Bono, How about the snowmobile. <laughs> yeah. The, the lady's like, well, we can take one on the snowmobile. And Bono, like, <laughs> Walks up and puts her arm, his arm around her, and he's like, "Come on!" And so she's like, "If you turn off the cameras," and he just like shrugs yeah, we'll her off. He's away. like, "Yeah, we'll put this away." And then like in the next scene in the show, um, the camera's right on Larry sitting on the motorcycle. <laughs> so I mean, they just don't care. They, no. There's there's no rules for you two. Uh -uh. They don't, they don't follow any rules. But um, the scene I picked was, um, I thought. It just proves that no matter how big a hero is, they're still going to have a hero. Right. Like they're going to have somebody they look up to. And that's kind of the point of this movie. Yeah. Is to explore the roots of American music. Yeah. You got the gospel, the blues. Yeah. Elvis. The and I mean, I picked the scene. There's a scene. Um, I picked this for a couple reasons. First off, um, it just shows how much you know they you know. American music and like some of the American artists have inspired them or you know what have you mm -hmm. and he introduces B.B. King and B.B. King's band to come on and play a song with him well he wrote they wrote this song for B.B. King right like they had B.B. King in mind when they wrote this song so and B.B. King does this song with him and you know obviously another reason I do this song you know I picked this scene was just because like as a group as a collective with my friends we do like we do this song so it's fun. Let's go ahead and take a look at that okay. with BB King, and then we'll discuss this some more when we come back. Let me introduce to you. I can introduce to you somebody whose music we just got to know and love over the last year or so, and this incredible band. This is BB King and the BB King's band here. Where's BB? Believe it or not, B.B. King came to Dublin, Ireland, and he was playing in this, this club in Dublin, Ireland, and we wrote this song for him. 
called uh, When Love Comes to Town. I had went to listen to the tape and I was able to uh, kind of get some of it together. I hope you like the song. I love the song. I think the, the, the lyrics is really, real heavy lyrics. You're mighty young to write such heavy lyrics. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those kind of rebel-like guys. I like to kind of get in there and see what's Break going on. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> They kind of look at me kind of weird. Uh, they say, here he is, a 62-year-old, and look what he's trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm 62. I'm no good with chords, so uh, what we do is get somebody else to play chords. And... Sure, well, they you do that. There's not much right. chords in this song. Yeah. I think there's only two. I'm horrible with chords. <laughs> All right, that was the coup de grace of today's show, the U2 video, um, Rattle and Hum. It was an, I thought I thought it was just an excellent, excellent movie, and I mean, it wasn't it wasn't true to form to most music videos like movies that I've seen just because you know they play the entire song most music like video documentaries do like they'll play only a portion of the song right. uh -huh. and that drives me nuts because like they usually cut it off right at the climax of the song and I hate it because I want to hear the rest but you know you know they go through the entire song and I love the transitions that it made between like recording and then like interviews and then to like a live shot like at a concert I, you know, just the transition that, you know, they made in between all those different shots was just wonderful. And, you know, the sound quality was great. Like, even in the recording shots, it, you know, it's yeah. just, it was just excellent. And I'm just a big fan of black and white, so, you know, I love that. Don't let, don't, the way I feel about black and white is don't ever let it being in black and white be a reason why you don't want to watch it. Because that's just not a good reason. No. Because you can't, you know... If it's good, it's gonna overpower it being in black and white, you know, in anything. Like I've watched movies from the 20s or the 30s that were in black and white, and I just thought they were excellent. But mm -hmm. just because the movie and the art itself was just great. Um, you have anything else to add about you two, Rattle and Home? About you two? Um, either one's fine. <sighs> hmm. Well. <laughs> no, not really. Not that I can think of. I'm sure I do. All right. Let me think. No. Nah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. All right. It's a pleasure. Um, to summarize, uh, all three of the movies this week were considered Palmer's picks. Um, the Sting, directed by George Roy something. I don't know. <laughs> Roy Hill. Uh, George Roy Hill um, was a Palmer's pick. Beautiful Girls, directed by Ted Deming was a Palmer's pick and Rattle and Hum obviously directed by uh, Phil Joanu was a Palmer's pick. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining. Um, I hope to see you next week. Uh, have a nice day. Thanks a lot. See you later. Yeah,